Just referencing the name of this series became a way to describe a show with a silly sounding premise that was cancelled almost immediately. Oh Jonathan, why couldn't you become something else? If Dr. Doolittle could not only talk to the animals, but become the animal, no judgement. Oh, and also fight crime. Oh, you are so right. The streets are full of unscrupulous people. He lives in Manhattan, he's manicured, he's manimal. <laughs> Do you hear me, Professor? Until you come out of there, I'm not letting go of anything. Well, that's very good advice, Miss Mackenzie. Yeah. Oh! Manimal is a show that you may or may not have seen, but even if you haven't seen it, you're probably aware of it. Manimal was for a long time a punchline, shorthand for being a very short-lived series, but yet it's a show that's got its fans. I was right. About what? My tarantula? was murdered. In Manimal, a man transforms himself into an animal and back again, without getting his hair messed up or his clothes wrinkled. I mean, just the clothes bit is a trick in itself, let alone the whole changing into animal shtick. That wound was pretty dirty. It had pieces of feathers in it. <laughs> Guy probably uses blade to skin birds. Yes, that is the logical explanation, isn't it? There's a period of the latter part of the 70s and the first half of the 80s when it seemed like every second cool show was either created or co-created by producer Glenn A. Larson. In order to get out of his contract at Universal Studios, he quickly dashed off a script for a show called Knight Rider and then drove across town where he had a new deal with 20th Century Fox, where for the 1983-84 season he managed to sell four new series quite an achievement, and it would have been an even bigger achievement had any of them been renewed for a second season. Master of the secrets that divide man from animal. Animal from man. Manimal. Manimal lasted a few weeks before being pulled from NBC's schedule, cancelled with only eight episodes produced. JC, where have you been? Oh, I'm sorry, Ty. I had to take off for a bit. It was a brutal year for the network, which cut a lot of its new shows, but also brutal for Larson, as all four of his new shows that year, including a favourite of ours, Auto Man, disappeared from the air like a hot air balloon that strayed too close to an archery school. He looks dead. <laughs> Looks like he fooled us, son. I'm glad, Dad. I really am. Dr. Jonathan Chase is a professor of criminology who's inherited from his father the ability to communicate with animals, but also, after some hot and heavy breathing, shapeshift into an animal, a skill he uses to solve crimes for the local police. He's helped by his fast-talking friend Tyrone Earl, who's seen it all thanks to his association with Chase dating back to Vietnam. In the show's pilot episode, policewoman Brooke McKenzie sees her partner injured, and Gilt's senior cop stereotyped Lieutenant Rivera into making her a detective so she can hunt the people responsible for putting her dear partner, uh, what's his face, out of action. Also, she made detective drinks on her. That's the deal. Brooke investigates Chase only to find out his secret. Please, don't shoot. I'm not armed. God, there's a wild animal on the loose. You could have been killed. Journal of Jonathan Chase. Experiments and transformation. The trio team up to investigate various crimes for the police department, even though Brooke is the only actual cop. Chase and Ty are freelance consultants. He's not even a cop. He shouldn't be interrogating her. You're yeah, right. That should be me in there. Everyone has their role in the plots. Well, would you believe a complicated charade between the American CIA and the Russian KGB? No. Chase turns into animals a few times each episode, puts the plot together and makes goo-goo eyes at the guest actresses. Excuse me. Maybe this is the last mistake you're ever going to make. Brooke gets into trouble, is rescued, arrests the perps at the end of the episode, and occasionally throws a jealous look at anyone flirting with Jonathan. Ty is there to help out and crack jokes. Have I ever mentioned to you what the C in Tyrone CRL stood for? Coward. 
Guess I did. Guard. Lieutenant Rivera is always the seen it all cop but serial skeptic who no one thinks to loop him in on Chase's abilities. He's not even the grumpy lieutenant stereotype he'd only ever served decaf. Don't get cute. Chase's luxury apartment has research facilities and its own menagerie, which sounds cool until you realize the poor animals have less room than a jail cell. For example, this zebra basically lives in his own toilet cubicle. How do you like them apples? When Jonathan needs to change into an animal, it's not instantaneous like Wonder Woman's quick change, nor violent like Dr. David Banner turning into the Hulk. Chase begins his metamorphosis with some heavy breathing, which may at least explain some of the creepy phone calls you sometimes get from his number. Then his body undergoes what looks like a very painful transformation. His skin sprouts fur or feathers, his eyes change, and his limbs extend or contract. It does look painful, like watching every episode of Law and Order without a toilet break. And his clothes are stored neatly somewhere, which is perhaps something we shouldn't look too closely at. Because the possibilities are... yeah. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry, did I hurt you? If I ignore the pain, the pleasure is exquisite. Well then, by all means, ignore the pain. The trio get involved in various plots, all of which are convenient excuses to change Chase into a different animal. He changes into a snake, a horse, Jonathan! a dolphin, a shark, a bear, a bird. Time to get out of here, man. That ain't no bull. but mostly changes into a hawk, or if he needs to go into a warehouse at night, a black panther. The cynic in me wants to say the panther would often appear in a warehouse at night so they could just use the same footage over and over. On closer inspection, it's probably just the same set redressed. Cynicism can certainly hamper enjoyment of some 80s television, but I keep my cynicism in check with this new treatment. Cinebix and Maximoxital treats the symptoms of cynicism from distrust, inability to accept things at face value, and ocular damage from too much eye rolling and expressions of sincerity. Ask your doctor or your vet or that guy behind 7-Eleven about Cinebexy Maximoxital. Side effects may include night sweat, sleeplessness, too much sleep, dry mouth, drooling, hair loss, cramps, extreme flatulence, and lupus. Changing from one life form to another. If a man could do that, some might call it a very great gift. Or a curse. Of the eight episodes made, Manimal's plots are partly the same old, same old, something about a racehorse, an episode with martial arts in Chinatown, ruthless businessmen taking over a small town, a murderous magic show, businessmen being killed by their business partners while their daughters tried to find their father's killer, another episode featured a girl raised by wolves returning to civilization, and another show had something about sailors slash pirates. There was nothing outrageous, but the show's inherent tongue-in-cheek style made the episodes breezy fun to watch. Jonathan, is that you? Oh, oh. Jonathan, a simple nod would suffice. There were a few minor changes between the pilot episode and the series. Michael D. Roberts came in to play Ty as a more comedic character, and Jonathan now drove himself. Instead of a Rolls Royce, he now drove a convertible Ferrari. Go on, make it feel better. I meant drink it. Donald Boyle originated the concept and took it to Glenn A. Larson, and together the two fleshed it out into Manimal. NBC bought the show and it premiered in September 1983, but was cancelled before the year was out. I suppose little time is better than none. Maybe cancellation's not the right word. Manimal escaped and was hunted down and destroyed by animal control. You have a cat to destroy? The special effects sequences of Manimal were elaborate for a television show at the time. Effects artist Stan Winston would create the transformations of Jonathan turning into a hawk or a panther. But on another occasion, another effects team turned Simon into a snake. And if he changed into something else, then you're probably out of luck if you wanted to see those transformations on screen. You, you trying to tell us something, JC? You're right. First word? Sounds like, um... Ah, there you are. The other expensive special effects were the animals themselves, which obviously gave the show some unique challenges. Hence the unintentionally funny insert shots of fake animal paws. <laughs> oh, that's my alarm. Time for more Cinebexy Maxi Moxitel. <sighs> wow, they really taught the panther to open files and turn pages. What an achievement! 
The main cast contribute to the slightly tongue-in-cheek feel that makes the episode so much fun to watch. I suppose it's going to be another one of those reports, right? With panthers and and anteaters and, uh, and, and mongoose. Well, not exactly. Simon McCorkendale as the dashing hero Chase does a good job as someone who has to look good while turning into a panther and not feel like a twat. Even when Chase is preparing for a deadly martial arts battle by practicing the fighting styles of various animals. <laughs> McCorkendale had appeared in a lot of productions on both sides of the Atlantic, things like I, Claudius and Quatermass. And after Manimal was put to sleep, had a long run on Falcon Crest, lots of guest appearances and casualty. McCorkendale played Jonathan Chase one more time in an episode of the 1990s Glenn Larson series, Nightman. Darling, that was something that I promised your mother I would never reveal to you. A syndicated series about a superhero who plays the saxophone. By now, the transformation effects were created in a computer. But anyway. And you can do that, Daddy? You can shapeshift? Yes, I can. But I rather suspect that you can too. Melody Anderson was one of those people who popped up everywhere in the early 80s, probably best remembered for playing Dale Arden in Flash Gordon. Michael D. Roberts had a very long career appearing in many programs. Rennie Santoni was briefly Dirty Harry's partner, and of course, as Poppy. <laughs> Manimal does have a lot of action, lots of chases, a horse chase, car chases, and of course, Jonathan Chase. I can see it now. This can be another one of your fun cases, isn't it? Dr. Chase gets the bulk of the action, but there's quite a bit for Ty and Brooke to be getting on with. Ah! I said I was lucky. Wouldn't yeah. you? Huh? That must have been the jackpot, huh? <sighs> Composer Paul Chihara created a pretty cool theme tune for Manimal's pilot, though most of the series had its music created by up-and-coming composer Alan Silvestri, who of course would go on to greater things. That's unbelievable! 200-foot lighthouse sinking? Manimal's pilot and first few episodes had the misfortune of being shown up against ratings juggernaut Dallas. If I hadn't seen it myself, I wouldn't have believed it. The show quickly died a death in the US market, but gained fans in Europe with France in particular really digging on Manimal. So much so that the idea of relaunching the show for the French market was briefly entertained. Big in France, huh? I'm not even gonna touch that while I'm still feeling the effects of Cinebexy Maximoxetel. We've stumbled onto something very big here. Manimal, for so long the butt of jokes, including an eight minute segment by David Letterman lampooning the show and it's being pulled from the schedule, has become a bit of a cult classic, which is code for somebody thought it's worth releasing on DVD. Oh, don't worry, Lieutenant. I'm sure that can be arranged. Before his death in 2014, Glenn Larson had been involved in efforts to relaunch Manimal as a film. But almost everything we've covered on this channel has been the subject of one or more attempts to relaunch, remake or reboot everything, regardless of whether there's actually much call for it. Oops, time for my meds. Sea Dog knows everything there is about Scrimshaw. Scrimshaw? Although I'd been aware of Manimal's existence since the early 80s, I'd never actually seen it. Before writing this review, I had no nostalgia for it, no warm feelings to inflate my opinion of the show. So that means there's no motivation to maximize Manimal. In fact, there's minimal Manimal maximizing going on and maximum Manimal minimizing manifesting itself in this media. So I liked it. Keep mumbling, uh, Panther's coming after. <laughs> not as much as I enjoyed Auto Man, but it's in the ballpark. Actually, maybe not in the ballpark, but trying to find somewhere nearby to park. So many of the shows we cover in this playlist of The Vault of Almost do tend to share a habit of running out of steam to the point where you couldn't see how they could continue had they actually received a renewal. Here's a bird dog flying from out of the sky and from the diver. Manimal as a series had its problems, but it's impossible to say whether the show could have found its legs. If you look at these shows and laugh at the pure cheese, then you probably don't want to watch Manimal. But there are genuine laughs from the characters, but also a few unintentional laughs from aspects of the premise and the execution. If you're in the mood for a quickie 80s goofball throwback that you could binge in a weekend, then Manimal is probably worth a look. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos. Oh, Manimal, man, animal, Manimal, I just got that. Oh, my brain hurts.
His specialty was using animals to solve crimes. Do you know what kind of animals he used? Well, a black panther and a large hawk. 